So I knew that we were uh, confronting danger. And that's the reason why we have today, uh, where we have uh, this, this situation where we have to give our kids the talk. Why do we have to give our kids the talk, right? The primary reason why, because we know there are people out there who are prepared and willing to kill us, right? That's the reality. And so we try to teach our young people to stay alive. You see, Black Panther Party of Self-Defense, all right? And so, so with that understanding, with that understanding, I knew that by my engaging in the party, at any given time, there was a possibility that I would be murdered by the police. You are now part of a social experiment. <laughs> See, no limit is, only got no oh, oh. Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us today on the journey towards self-mastery. Our next guest is a former member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. He joined the Black Panther Party at 16 years old. He would later become a member of the Black Liberation Army. At 19 years old, he was arrested and would spend the next 49 years in prison as a political prisoner. Even in prison, he was able to make an impact teaching Black history and inspiring the people around him to gain knowledge of self and make better choices. He's one of the remaining founding members of the Jericho Movement that aims to fight for the freedom of political prisoners all over the United States. In 2020, he was released from prison and has not missed a beat. He's still fighting for the liberation of Black people. Let's welcome today author of We Are Our Own Liberators, activist, and former political prisoner, Jalil Montaki, to the program. Hey, my brother, assalamu alaikum, peace, pause, Baragani, Jumbo, Irene, Afa Adair, Papeng, Tukunta, Gutenta, Bonjour, whatever your language is, <laughs> I, I greet you in peace and solidarity. Greetings, my brother. Um, definitely an honor to have you on the program. Um, and uh, I just appreciate, you know, the work that you have done for Black folks uh, dating back to the late 60s, early 70s, to where we are today. You're still doing the work, man. So uh, kudos to you, man. Um, I did want to start off just for some listeners to get an understanding of uh, your your story a little bit and why you were in prison for 49 years. So can you, um, before we even do that, can you first tell us about, you know, yourself in regards to your story as a political prisoner and why you were in prison for 49 years? Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Um, I was born in Oakland, California, uh, October 18, 1951 at 3.43 a.m. at Kaiser Permanente Hospital. I was raised in California for the most part, uh, 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 in the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Jose. Went to, went to elementary school in San Francisco, high school in San Jose. Uh, I was raised in a household where it was black consciousness in my household. My mom had been a uh, student of uh, African dance. As a young woman raising two kids, when she taught her children, myself and my sister, uh, African dance. And one of the things that her African instructor told her was that she is of African descent. And so she taught that to us, my, my sister and I, that we are of African descent, that we are not Negroes, we're not colored, we're not African-Americans, we're not coons, we're not the N-word or any other derogatory made-up name that was imposed upon African people when they brought to this country. And so I was raised in the idea of knowing myself as being of African descent. And so that's one thing that was uh, set me apart, made me different from uh, most kids uh, that I grew up with, particularly in our community. I was also raised in the time of Jim Crow. And so I remember one incident where I had to ride the bus to school. And at that time, black people had to had to ride the back of the bus, right? Mm -hmm. And so that one day I decided, I'm nine years old, I decided I'm not gonna ride the back of the bus. I'm gonna ride in the front, right, with the white folks. And the bus driver told me I had to go back in the bus. And a white woman stood up and said, no, you can stay up here and sit with me, right? And the bus driver didn't want to have no beef with her, and so I stayed and sat with her. So she got to a bus stop and she got off. And when she got off, the bus driver turned around and told me, said, now take your black ass to the back of the bus, mm -hmm. right? I stood up, looked around to see if any other white person was willing and prepared to stand up for me and let me sit up there with them. None of them did, all right? So what I did, I went to the back of the bus. Right. And that was a lesson for me. The lesson for me was both moral and as well as political, right? The moral aspect is this here. Here is one person, a white woman, who defied the law, 
right? Her moral character, her moral obligation, her moral sense of self was one that she was not uh, adhering to what the law said, right? She rebelled against the law. But the point is that the majority of the individuals on that bus, particularly white people, knew the law was wrong. But they did not have the moral turpitude. They didn't have the moral uh, strength, the, uh, the moral consciousness, right? To mm -hmm. engage uh, the bus driver in this sense, right? Or engage themselves as to the moral uh, 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 determination that black people was made to feel less than inferior than white people, all right? And so that was a lesson for me, a social lesson for me, but an understanding that there are uh, uh, people, right, who will go up against the law when they know the law is wrong. And so that's my first lesson in terms of rebellion, right? right. Uh, and so from there, I went on, we, my mom was in the WACP, went on marches and stuff like that. She carried some marches and stuff with WACP. At the time when I was, got into high school, I uh, became a, a, a leading member of the Black Student Union. Uh, they had Black studies in classes and schools where they didn't have any before, right? Eventually, I became part of a, a, a cultural nationalist organization called US, right? Uh, it was the House of Emoja, was affiliated with the US organization, Ron Karenga's US organization. And then from there, I transitioned into uh, to the Black Panther Party by the age of 16. What was, uh, it, what was it about the Black Panther Party specifically that that uh, caught your eye? The main thing that caught my eye about the Black Panther Party, <clears throat> one of the main things that caught my eye about the Black Panther Party was that they was they were willing to uh, sacrifice uh, themselves, their lives, right, for the struggle, right? They was uh, carrying weapons, right, in the streets, right, challenging the system, you know, f up front. Uh, when they went to uh, uh, Sacramento, I believe it was in 1968. Mm -hmm. I think they went to Sacramento in 1968 to challenge what was called the Mumford Law, right? That's mm -hmm. when the state decided, because at that point in time, prior to the Mumford Law, California was an open carry state, right? You can carry your weapons in the openly, right? <clears throat> now, when black people start carrying their weapons openly, Ronald Reagan, who was then governor of California at the time, determined that it's time to change the law, right? And so they uh, changed the law to remove open carry, carry law and have what's called the Mumford Law. And so Black Panther Party went to, uh, uh, up to uh, the capital, Sacramento, to challenge uh, them uh, imposing the Mumford Law. And uh, it, it ended up becoming a, a national spectacle uh, mm -hmm. when they uh, mistakenly went into the wrong door and went to the assembly hall rather than going up into the, the, the balcony uh, where people are usually go when they're going to review what's going on in, in the legislature, right? And as a result of that, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Capitol Police uh, came around and, and wanted to take their weapons from them and arrested them, and et cetera, et cetera. And it became a national spectacle. And for me, that was empowering. To see that as a young kid, a conscious young kid, was empowering. And I knew then and there, I'm one of these days, I'm going to be a Black Panther Party member. Mm. Yeah. Now, you told your mother this, and your mom was like, nah, like, what? why didn't she want you to be a part of it? Yeah, well, because mom was, was in support of... Uh, um, of uh, uh, NAACP, Martin Luther King, you know, uh, uh, the peaceful, the peaceful resistance of Martin Luther King. Uh, another example uh, uh, in terms of my understanding consciousness and, and that dichotomy between my generation, my mom's generation, was the time when uh, Al Haj Malik Shabazz and Malcolm X was, was murdered, right? Uh, I believe I was maybe in the eighth grade or seventh grade. And a young white girl came up and, and grabbed me and hugged me and said, they killed him, they killed him, they killed him. I looked at her, he's a friend, you know, I just, he killed him. I said, who did they kill? He said, Malcolm X. I said, who's Malcolm X? Mm -hmm. I had no clue. I went home and asked my mom, I said, mom, they killed Malcolm X. Who's Malcolm X? She said, listen, you don't want to know nothing about no Malcolm X, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about Martin Luther King. That's what we talk about in this house. So naturally, right, I had to go find out who Malcolm X is. <laughs> and I wanted to go find his autobiography and read his books. Right? And that's what I learned about Malcolm X. And so what we find is that the generational right uh, divide, the generational divide in terms of uh, that struggle during that period of time. I don't think that divide exists anymore uh, in generational. I think our people have come to understanding that uh, uh, there are those individuals who capitulate uh, with the system, those individuals who want to assimilate into the system, right, and, and those who actually want to oppose the system and find themselves uh, 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 defending the idea of national liberation and independence, 
Mm. And so I think we're, we're growing in that development, growing in that understanding uh, that we have to divorce ourselves from a system of white supremacy and capitalist imperialism. Right. Now, um, another death I think that was significant, uh, especially for the Black Panthers, um, was Martin Luther King's death. So how old were you during, after Martin Luther King's assassination? That was 1968. I was 16 to going, on, going on 17. So what, what impact did, did his death have on you? And then also, too, naturally, at that... Naturally, seeing that people was, was rioting across the country mm-hmm. right, and, and, and showing emotionally, showing their, their disgust with the system, uh, yes, that impacted me as well as a young kid, recognizing that we have the, the power, the power to explode and tear shit, tear stuff up, right? <laughs> and, and with that understanding, and with that understanding, I knew that if that if that power was organized, if it was organized and directed strategically, it could be a powerful force. And that's what Black Panther Party represented during that period of time. And that's the reason why J. Edgar Hoover determined that the Black Panther Party is the greatest threat to the national security of the United States because mm-hmm. it was organized. Yes, sir. So, at 16 years old, did you just walk into uh, headquarters, like to uh, say you want to be a part? Like, what was that process like for you? Yeah, uh, well, I, I was hanging out with some of my my high school, my excuse me, my junior high school friends who had just become party members, right? And so we was out in front of the party office, and we was I was helping out uh, get the papers uh, out of the truck so they'd be delivered into the community, mm-hmm. right? The Black Panther Party newspaper, right? Uh, so the people don't know the Black Panther Party had one of the largest circulation of newspapers. Uh, uh, during that period of time. They had a circulation of about 250,000 pages, 350,000 mm. uh, papers, right? Monthly, monthly. And you imagine how that extended from hand to hand, right? It reached about a million people monthly. We're always reaching about a million people with our newspaper. And so during that time, while we was getting the, the, the bulk of the papers out and, and getting them ready for distribution and so forth and so on, I decided I'm going to become a Black Panther Party member. And I walked into the office. This is on, on uh, Fillmore Street. Uh, uh, the Fillmore office in San Francisco. Walked into the office. I told them I'm going to be a party member. Right? And they gave me an application. I filled out the application. And then I began the process of going to study classes, uh, study uh, PE classes, TE, PE classes, political education classes. And because you have to go through PE, pop, a political education classes to really understand the dynamics of what the Black Panther Party was. Black Panther Party didn't let you come in and just be anybody and, and not have any foundation for which to operate from. Mm-hmm. And so that was part of the part of the, my, my uh, first understanding of the real politics of uh, struggle, real politics of revolution. Mm. And what were some of the politics of the Black Panther Party that you were learning at the time? One of the things that uh, many people know that the Black Panther Party first initial fundraiser, right, was used as a fundraiser, was a Mao Zedong uh, uh, Red Book, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. you used to get the Red Book and sell the Red Book and raise funds, but we also were taught out of the Red Book, right? Another book was uh, uh, France for Not, Wretched of the Earth. Mm-hmm. It was another book that we used uh, to teach one. Another one was Richard uh, uh, Debray. Jeez, I can't remember his first name. Uh, Debray, uh, his book. Um, and there's many, many others that we that we studied uh, during that period of time. And also, too, like part of uh, Huey P. Newton's philosophy, which he talks about in his book. Yeah, uh, Richard, his name is Richard Debray. Richard Debray. Got it. Okay. Got it. Um, so yeah, part of Huey P. Newton's philosophy, which he talks about in his book, Revolutionary Suicide, was that if you were going to be a revolutionary, you had to know that at any moment your life, you know, might be taken as a, you know, part of the revolution. And it was the price that you paid for being a revolutionary. So at 16 years old, was this conversation had with you? With me? I, I innately understood that because of the work that we were doing and seeing some of my comrades being hassled and harassed arrested and or killed by the police. So I knew that we were uh, confronting danger. And that's the reason why we have today, uh, where we have uh, this, this situation where we have to give our kids to talk. Why do we have to give our kids to talk? Right? The primary reason why, because we know there are people out there who are prepared and willing to kill us. Right? That's the reality. And so we try to teach our young people to stay alive. You see? Black Panther Party of Self-Defense. Right? And so, so with that understanding, with that understanding, I knew that by my engaging in the party, at any given time, there was a possibility that I would be murdered by the police. Got you. So, you know, after you go through the PE uh, process and everything, you get your education. Uh, what were the next steps? What were you doing? Well, not you got to sell the paper, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, be out there selling the paper, uh, doing that work, right? 
or you get assigned to the free breast program, or you get assigned to the health clinic, or you get assigned to certain other uh, areas of concern. A couple of times, I always signed to areas of, uh, of patrol and security. Uh, when uh, Betty Shabazz came to uh, San Francisco after Al Hodge Marie Shabazz was murdered, right? I was on part of the, the security patrol, right? Mm. We were security uh, patrol for her, you know, when they brought her in. And so those kind of things was, was important in, in our training. Got you. Got you. Um, were you trained on how to use a gun and things like that, or did you already Absolutely. know that? No, 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 no. There, there are what we call technical training or TE, technical equipment training, right? Where you are taught how to use weapon, the proper use of weapon. One of the things that was imposed upon or, or impressed upon in the party is that every party house had to have a shotgun. Had to have a shotgun in that house in order to defend itself, mm -hmm. right? And so that was part of the reasons why uh, the training was necessary, right? You couldn't have people have weapons and then know how to use them and right? the proper use, the proper care of weapons. And mm -hmm. so that was really important with the party as well. Right. So now you are really into, you know, entrenched in the party. What do you say to those that um, really don't know that history that say, you know, the Black Panthers were a terrorist organization, they were separatists, they were racist, um, what do you what do you say to people that that say that about the party? They need to go study the party's work, right? You can't let people tell you about the party. You got to go study the party. Mm. And when you go study the party, then you know what the party is about, right? There's all kinds of naysayers. There's naysayers about us being, having been able to read. You know what I mean? When they didn't want us to read, there's naysayers, right? right. So for us and our struggle for empowerment, our struggle for freedom, real freedom, right? We we're always gonna have naysayers. I, I'll give you another example of that. <clears throat> Dr. Martin Luther King, in his later years, uh, back in 1968, uh, 1968 uh, prior to him being arrested, he made a speech called The Other America. Mm -hmm. Nobody had heard that speech. They should go get that speech. Go get that speech, Other America, and go get Malcolm X's speech, uh, a message to the grassroots, and compare them. And you'll find that there's similar exchanges of ideas and concerns and, and, and theoretical foundations for which uh, they're viewing the future. Both of them, in each of those speeches, said we, black people in this country, African people in this country, are uh, suffering from, from uh, state-sponsored genocides. Malcolm X said that in 1964, in his message to the grassroots. Uh, 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 Mal uh, uh, Martin Luther King said that in 1968, in his other America. Right. Right? Martin Luther said at that time that he began to rethinking his struggle for integration, right? Because he felt that he now, he he was uh, uh, directing his people to go into a burning building, looking at mm -hmm. the United States as a burning building, right? And he started to reflect on that and started to consider, said, maybe this integration thing is not what we need to be doing, mm -hmm. okay? And that's why we got a problem today with many of our black so-called elites, right? Because they have become assimilated. People need to go look up that word assimilated and what assimilation means, right? And we, now we have a bunch of black people who have assimilated into a system of white supremacy. Right. And so they have all the, the trappings, all the colors, all of, of being black. Right. But they look for white people for their uh, uh, affirmation. Right. Uh, for, for their value. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and as a result of that, oftentimes they misguide black people in terms of their own advantages. Right. Seeking their own opportunity, seeing their own advantage at the risk, at the risk of uh, defeating our struggle, at the risk of undermining our movement, at the risk of selling out our people. Mm. Understood, understood. So uh, from 16 to 19, you're an active member, and then uh, you become a part of the Black Liberation Army. Uh, so can you share with us what exactly the Black Liberation Army was and then what your responsibilities were? Yes, yeah, you introduced me as, as, a, as a former member, right? I'm not a former member. I'm a veteran. Mm. I'm a veteran of the Black Panther Party and a veteran of the Black Liberation Army. Mm, th now, thank you for that correction, sir. Appreciate keep that. This, keep this un understood. The Black mm -hmm. Panther Party, from its inception, rule number six of the Black Panther Party was that no Black Panther Party member can join an underground organization except for the Black Liberation Army. Right? Therefore, when Hugh P. Newton and Bobby Seals had the conception, had the idea of building a Black Panther Party, they knew at some point in time we would necessarily have to engage in armed struggle. And so there was a point in, in our development of the Black Panther Party that they began to also begin the development of the Black Underground, right? The Black Underground, the, that military armed wing 
of the movement, right, which evolved and became to be known as the Black Liberation Army. And at the age of 18, going on 19, I was recruited into the Black Liberation Army, mm. to the Black Underground. Right. Now, right in, now. in your book, um, which I have right here, right here we are. Oh, you're right here. Yeah, um, okay. I sir. thought you were going to get it today. <laughs> Very good. Got the book. Um, definitely got to examine it. Um, just got it today. But um, I was flipping through it, and you had some um parts, uh, just dating. You know, some some things that occurred with the Black Liberation Army, some dates and things like that. And looking at it, you know, it's very different than I guess the Black Panthers for self defense. It seemed like the Black Liberation Army was more on the offense, uh, was more offensive. So, um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that um that's what it was, or was was it still part? of the self-defense. No, it's always part of self-defense. Although, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you look at a, a military strategy, military uh, strategy, there's always a, a degree of offense and defense, right? And some offense is also defensive. Some defense is also offensive, depends upon how it's being applied, right, in the military sense. And so for the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army, the Black Liberation Army was the armed wing of the Black Panther Party. When the Black Panther Party was the mass organization, the above ground organization, the Black Liberation Army was the underground organization or the clandestine organization. And what it did, what it operated on, ensured that the Black Panther Party would survive by chastising a system that was oppressing the Black Panther Party, right? Or, to, or, or oppressing our community, right? Letting, letting them folks know that if somebody gonna die, then, you know, there's not gonna be no discrimination here. All right. If somebody's going to bleed, then both sides is going to bleed. OK. Mm -hmm. And so keep this also in mind. Statistically, right? And historically established, statistically, when the Black Liberation Army was on the move, right, police killing the black people diminished. Right. It slowed down, way down. OK. When they destroyed the Black Panther Party, the killing the black, uh, black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army, the killing the black people skyrocketed. Mm. Right. Because there was no reprisals, there was no fear, right? And they began killing us with impunity prior to, as they were doing, prior to the existence of the Black Panther Party. Mm. Speaking of the demise of the Black Panther Party, one of the main things, I know you talk about this a lot too in your book and um, during your lectures and interviews was COINTELPRO. Were you guys aware of COINTELPRO at the time of um, the party? Um, and if you were, what 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 were some things done in defense of COINTELPRO? And then for those that don't know, can you share the information that you have about what it is and how it came about, COINTELPRO? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a long tra trajectory to the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, and J. Edgar Hoover, who, who eventually evolved to become the director and uh, established uh, what is called COINTEL Counterintelligence Program. That's COINTELPRO, Counterintelligence Program. Well, we got to keep in mind that J. Edgar Hoover, as a young agent, Marcus Messiah Garvey, right? Mm -hmm. He was on Marcus Messiah Garvey's case to get rid of Marcus, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey, right? And that was the first point where he began to recognize the extent for which an individual and organization is able to organize Black people in their own uh, 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 goals and objectives, right, for their own empowerment. And so we find that in COINTELPRO, but one of the things in COINTELPRO was to prevent the rise of a messiah, right? This is Edward Hoover, right? This is a lesson that he learned from dealing with uh, 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 the greatest, the greatest organizer of black people in our contemporary times, mm -hmm. Marcus Messiah Garvey, right? He saw Marcus Garvey organizing in America, organized in Latin America, organized in the Caribbean, organized in Africa, organized in England, right? That's fearful for white supremacy, right? And mm -hmm. and the other group was a white supremacist. I keep that understood, right? And so he created conditions from which to, to destroy the Black Panther Party. He utilized every method, every tactic that the state would use to destabilize a country, including assassination, right? provocateurism, surveillance, infiltration, right? All those little dirty tricks that they use against other nations, they use against the Black Panther Party to destroy the Black Panther Party. Mm. So, uh, what... to the point where in one of his documents, wait, wait, let me make this point. In one of his documents, he says he said that young uh, black people, young black black people, if they should become uh, 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 ingrained or uh, uh, 
become part of a movement, a black liberation, right? Become revolutionaries, they'd be dead revolutionary. Mm. That's in favor. That's in right. That's in, they have a program called neutralization. Neutralization means to terminate, right? To exterminate. That's what neutralization means. And in the paper, they talk about neutralization, okay? And they said, he said they would be dead revolutionary. He didn't say they would be captured and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. He didn't say that. He said they'd be dead revolutionary. So in essence, he was saying that they would be executed. They would be neutralized. That was part of the FBI. That's part of the state sanctioned terror that black people have to suffer and continue to suffer to this very day. Mm. So how did you guys find out about COINTELPRO? Um, and then when, when did you know about it as far as the party goes? be honest with you, we didn't learn about it until years, years later. Years later, after many of us had been convicted and, and sent to prison, I did we learn about COINTELPRO. Um, it was a hidden directive of the FBI, right? <clears throat> uh, and, and so uh, we didn't understand. One of the things we didn't understand, we didn't understand to what extent the government would use its dirty tactics, right, to suppress a movement, right, and to, to dislodge and, and disconnect the movement from the people. Right. And so that in my in my understanding of being an elder now, right, we were infantile, infantile in our understanding to what extent the government would use its resources to repress our struggle for national liberation and independence. Mm. I remember in a previous interview, too, you said that a white uh, organizational group that was uh, against Vietnam War uh, infiltrated like an FBI office or whatever. And they're the ones that found the COINTEL Pro papers. That's that's true. That was in uh, Meet Philadelphia. Meet Philadelphia, a group of uh, um, of uh, environmentalist uh, uh, activists, right, broke into the FBI station, right, in Meade, Meade, M-E-A-D-E, uh, Pennsylvania, right, and they confiscated these documents. They didn't know what they're going to have, right. There's anti-war drafters and, and et cetera, right, and mm-hmm. they got these documents saw what they had, make copies, and distribute them. And that's how we learned about the FBI. I learned about the FBI going to a pro program. Mm. Got it, got it. So um, transitioning back to the Black Liberation Army. So as a member, you were accused of being part of uh, something that occurred that led to the murder of two uh, police officers. And it was um, a few of you that were trial and convicted um for that for the for those murders um can you talk about that incident and um your role i know you you plead your innocence and everything um so what, absolutely let's what, let's, let's, let's deal with this from this level from this from this degree right we're talking about cointel pro right one thing we didn't understand that there was a secret another secret aspect of cointel pro called new kill which means new york killing right new kill right new york killing right uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the slaying of these two police officers was on May 21st, 1971, right? On May 26th, 1971, the very next week, J. Edgar Hoover was in the White House with Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon told J. Edgar Hoover, find the Black Panther Party guilty of these murders. Straight like that, mm-hmm. right? We didn't find out these documents until years later. I'm talking about this, this. This is documented, right? That, and when the FBI... Did, Start making these moves, they did not tell the New York City Police Department that they were making these moves, right? Okay, now let's go. In the course of trial, through the course of trial, uh, we had what we call it, a part of the trial called discovery, right? Where you're supposed to get discovery most and learn what they have against you and so forth and so on, right? An FBI document went to the, uh, uh, a call made to the prosecutor, because that's what we, uh, what we call Brady material, right? I mean, material supposed to be exculpatory. Right, Brady material. The FBI asked the district attorney if any of the documents that were turned over to the defense well, could identify the FBI or the White House engagement in this case. And the district attorney told the FBI, uh, uh, Daniel Hoover and his crew, that none of the documents that were turned over to us, the defense, could be notified or be known as coming from the FBI or from the White House. There was a pure cover up. And I'll give you another example, mm-hmm. right? We had a New York City police ballistic expert named George Simmons. I'll say his name. Named George Simmons got on the stand and testified that the weapon that they claimed that I used in this case was the actual murder weapon. Right? That's what he said. Mm-hmm. Right? He got on and testified, man. We got, we got documents years later after conviction 
that determined that he never did the ballistic test, that the FBI did the ballistic test, and they determined that the weapon they claimed that I used was inconclusive as being the actual murder weapon, right? So I did 49 years for a gun that they know that they knew was not the murder weapon. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. So we had those kind of irregularities, you might say, or cover-ups in this particular case. And I did 49 years for, for a weapon that I did not use, that, that they know that was not used in this particular case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 49 years. I can't even fathom 49 That's years. New That's new kills. That's right. 49 yeah. plus years, bro. I can't even fathom that, man. So another thing too, like we're told you, you were 19 years old, man. So walk us through the moment of your arrest and then you gaining the understanding that you were going to be in prison for, for a long time, man. What was, what, 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 well, that what reality, was... that reality, that reality came to me uh, a lot earlier uh, in the course of my, um, my arrest. Soon as I was arrested and I understood the magnitude of my arrest, I knew that I was going to be away for a while. Matter of fact, I told my daughter's mother, you know, listen, I'll see you later. You know, uh, go enjoy your life. Take care of my kid, right? And uh, if we should, you know, get the together some other time down the line, then we do so. But I'm not going to hold you or burden you with me, right, when you have a child to raise on your own, okay? I knew I was going to be gone for a while, and I understood that. And again, my, my daughter, as I made mention earlier, my daughter was in the womb, in the womb when I was arrested. Mm -hmm. And there's one day in the streets with her. Right, until she was 50 years old when mm. I got out of prison. Okay. First time we was able to actually be in the living room at home, you know what I'm saying, sharing a meal together. Right. 50 years. Mm. All right. And so, yeah, I, I knew that at that point. But let me say this also I knew they were not going to keep me in prison. I knew that. Right. I knew it was going to take some time to get out, but I knew I'm coming out of there. Right. I did everything I possibly could to make, them, make my stay in prison unwelcome for them. Mm. Can you expound on that? Well, organizing. Organizing. While, while I was in San Quentin, I organized the first national uh, prisoner's newspaper called Army Spirit. I organized the first uh, a petition to the prisoner's petition to the United Nations that was heard at the United Nations. I organized uh, 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 the first national prisoner support group organization called Jericho Movement. I assisted in organizing Spirit of Mandela campaign where we had the international jurors come to the United States uh, in uh, uh, October 25th, 2021, and determined that the United States has been engaged in charges of genocide against Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. Found guilty by mm. esteemed by the international jurors. Determined the United States has found guilty of genocide against Black people, against Brown people, against Indigenous people. On five charges, charges are what? Mass incarceration. Police murder and killing of black, brown, and indigenous people. Health inequities. Why does white people live twice as long as black people in this country? Right? Health mm -hmm. inequities. Environmental racism. Environmental racism. Why do we suffer so much illness, uh, uh, asthma, diabetes, heart ailments, and all kidney disease, and et cetera? Right? Environmental racism. And lastly, the existence of political prisoners. Right? The existence of political prisoners. And in all those issues, cumulatively, they have counted them out to genocide, right? If people don't understand what the word genocide means, I'd just like to just give them an understanding very briefly what genocide is, right? Genocide by the 1948 Convention states that killing members of the group, they know we know they've been killing us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, causing serious body or mental harm uh, to members of the group. Yes, they do that to us, right? We have all kinds of trauma for navigating 500 years 400 years of white supremacy, right? deliberately inflicting on the group conditions conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. In whole or in part. Calculated to do this, right? Uh, D, imposing measures intended to prevent the births within the group. We know they'll be sterilizing our women, sterilizing uh, Puerto Rican women, sterilizing, uh, sterilizing Native American women. Sterilizing of people without consent. There's a case going on in Chuckchilla uh, uh, Prison in California right now where they're sterilizing women against their consent. Yeah, sterilizing mm -hmm. people, right? And forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, right? We know they did that with the Native Americans, right? Took those babies, gave them to missionaries, cut off their hair, took their names, took away their spirituality, right? And just just denied their, their own humanity, 
uh, these, these native children. Not only that, when we look at the foster care system in the United States today, you find a majority of people in foster care are black, brown, and indigenous children. What's happened to those families? Where are these kids' families come from? Where are they? Right? Many of them in prison. Many of them have, have lost their, 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 uh, uh, their, their ability to, to take care of their kids because of object poverty that's in, in, imposed upon in our community, as our community has been always, has always been, and will continue to be until we liberate ourselves uh, 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 under severe surveillance, right? Uh, by the patrol, the slave patrol, uh, uh, quit, right? The police, okay? And you know the history of the police, you know the history of the slave patrols, okay? And so that was the conditions of genocide. Now, not only that, but the 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 the, the, the rule of law says in the 1948 convention says that genocide is punishable. Right? Genocide is punishable. Conspiracy to commit genocides, threat and public incitement to commit genocides, or uh, attempt to commit genocides, and complicity in genocides. Right. So we know that the United States have been engaged in the practice of genocide against black, brown, indigenous people. International jurors have determined that the, that the United States is guilty of at least five charges of genocide, right? And so, therefore, us, we, our, our people, have decided, in terms of our struggle, to divorce ourselves from a system of genocide, to divorce ourselves from a system that has caused us traumatic harm, mm -hmm. deadly harm. We have to move away from this, this deadly, beastly entity that they call the United States of America. There have always been a white supremacist government. Oh, so in order that... to have white supremacy, in order to have white supremacy, you got to have black inferiority. You see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right? And so that's important for us to know. Right? So we have to create the conditions to maintain the system of white supremacy. That means that black people, brown people, and indigenous people have to be felt, have to be made to be inferior or less than. You see? All right? And let's also make this note. White supremacy is a mental disorder. People don't really understand the nature of that. It's a mental disorder. In the DSMV book, right, it was a psychological diagnostic book, right, mm -hmm. that all psychiatry psychologists uses, right, it, it, it has a particular disorder called superiority complex. A superiority complex is a mental disorder. And white supremacy is the derivative of what? A superiority complex. Yes, sir. All right? So how can you not say white supremacy is not a mental disorder? Mm. Well, it is. Now, with that whole concept of divorcing from the United States, does that mean, in your view, that Black folks go back to Africa? How do you divorce and still stay in the country? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, very good question. Right now, we're doing two things in terms of the uh, understanding the, the decision of the international jurors uh, in the International Tribunal of 2021. Uh, 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 we have determined necessity to create alternative systems, alternative system to the existing system. So we recognize that the, the, the existing system is not working in our best benefit, not working in our best interest. And so what we're doing, we're in the process of what we could build what we call a people's senate across the country, right? We're in the process of doing that now, right? Building a people's senate so the purpose of building a people's senate so we can build people's assemblies across the country, and people began to organize themselves for themselves, right? Uh, we, we also organized what we call decolonization program. So we know that we have been colonized, right? Not only have we been colonized physically, socioeconomically, we've been colonized mentally, right? Our brain cells have been colonized. You see what I'm saying? No way in the hell that we can say that people can live under a system for 400 years of white supremacy and have not been traumatized by that system. You have to be. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to navigate this, this system. All right. Mm -hmm. And so we have been traumatized. So we're going into the process of decolonization program. Not only that, we also know that in this country, there are sovereign nations. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Native Americans, many Native Americans are sovereign nations. How come we can't be a sovereign nation if we chose to be one? Right. According to the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, we have an op we have a right to become a sovereign nation. In fact, uh, a Declaration of Human Rights says Everyone has a right to a nationality, and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality or denied the right to change his nationality. So who says that we cannot be changed our nationality? I identify myself as a new African, right? Mm -hmm. At this point in date, in date and time right now, right, black people, African people in this country, majority live in the Black Belt South today. Black Belt South, right? That's South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi. 
Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, five states. All right? Those are our inherited national homeland in this territory that we call the United States, which is true name is, is Turtle Island by the indigenous people. Right? right? That's our natural homeland. And so for us, it is important that we begin the processes of restoring our national homeland. Okay? Now we can talk about the history of that and how that evolved coming back to uh, uh, the um, 1863, 1864 Emancipation Proclamation, 1862 Emancipation Proclamation, and Field Order Number 15 that was issued by General Tucumense Sherman right, during the Civil War, which, which created the conditions from which emancipated slaves would be able to live from South Carolina, uh, St. John North River to the Florida Basin Right, would be territory governed by black people. Right, right. that's when we get organized. We call uh, the uh, the uh, um, organizing the Freedom Bureau. Right, the Freedom Bureau was 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 the the mechanism of organizing and establishing our go governing forces. Right, and then what happened? The Hayes and Tilden Compromise. The Hayes and Tilden Compromise, when we were uh, uh, building our, a national territory, building a homeland. Right, in that territory it will be emancipated was, was was presented to us, right? Mm -hmm. Hayes Field and Compromise took that away from us. Took it away. Mm -hmm. Right? And that began began the process of 100 years of lynching and the first major exodus out of the South, right, into the North and into the West. Right. Right. So, but if you don't understand the history, because they don't teach us that history, right? As Carter G. Woodson has said, the miseducation of the Negro and his boy, the miseducation of the Negro. We're not taught the truth. We're not taught our history, our true history, our history of resistance in this country. We don't know it. And because we don't know it, what when we do have individuals or organizations that resist, it looks like an anomaly, right? It looks like something uh, out of from outer space somewhere, right? It seems to be unnatural. No, it's not unnatural. It's a natural occurrence of fighting against repression, fighting against oppression, fighting against those who hate us, right? But it's because of the color of our skin. Right? Mm -hmm. Who believe that we are less than human? Right? That's what they believe. You see what I'm saying? They believe that we continue to be beasts of burden, right? To be to be domesticated, right? And that's what the penal penal slave system is all about, right? right. Penal slave system because of the Thirteenth Amendment, right? Thirteenth Amendment says slavery and voluntary servitude shall not exist in the United States or its jurisdictions except for those who are duly convicted of a crime. The small print, the exception clause. That informs us in 1863 and 1865 when they ended chattel slavery, they started penal slavery, right? Because the government knew that there was still money to be made for free labor, right? For free labor. And they started creating the laws to usher people back into a system of penal servitude, mm -hmm. right? Like the Black Codes, okay, for instance, and Jim Crow, right? And then lastly, mass incarceration, okay? And so they continued to to create the conditions to put us back into a system of slavery. That's what we're fighting against now. We want to end the system of slavery in all of its manifestation and form. Gotcha. Now, along with, with that whole concept, what do you say to Black folks that's like, you know, my business is doing great. I got a good relationship with white folks. Like, I'm not I'm not trying to be a part of this whole thing about, you know, you know, uh, being separate and all that stuff and doing our own people sovereign thing. Like, I'm just trying to build my business and be a capitalist and chill, man. Take care of my family. What what was this guy black, 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 just black talking about? Right? Black <laughs> capitalist, right? You want to be a black capitalist? Okay, let's let's put it this way. A black capitalist cannot exist without white capitalism. And white capitalism is, is exploitative across the board. So you're saying that black people want to exploit other black people. That's what you're saying. Because capitalism is based upon exploitation, exploiting the profits, exploiting the labor of other people, right? That's what capitalism is about. Capitalism mm -hmm. is based upon uh, two things, right? Individualism and competition, right? You can't have a capitalist system without those two. Mm -hmm. And so you say these black people want to be individuals, right? They want to be part of, recognize the part of the black nation, recognize the part of black people. Why? Because they have come assimilated. They assimilated into the system of white supremacy. They have a decolonized mind. They have a colonized mind. They have a colonized mentality. They're neocolonial agents of the state. Right? Let's put it that way it is. All right? Let's recognize it. You see what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. who they are. They, yeah, I got good friends with these white folks. 
You were host. Hey, you know, you're not, you're not, you ever watched the movie Roots? The yes, sir. Roots, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. And at the end of Roots, there was the one uh, uh, when, they, when, the, when the African people were slave, uh, uh, was free. Right? There's one guy by the name of Chicken George, right, in Roots. Mm-hmm. One thing that Chicken George struck with me, and I'll never forget, right? He says, I don't know how to be free. I don't think he learned how to be a slave, right? So the same thing with these black capitalists. I don't think they know how to follow behind these white folks. You know what I'm saying? Be part of their world. They don't know how to be free. They're scared of freedom. You see what I'm saying? So that's what that's about, right? Mm-hmm. right? They don't have no love for our people. They don't really have no love for themselves. But they got a love of, love of money. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's what it's about, you know? And so when we understand the, the psychology engaged in that, with that thinking, with that understanding, we know that these people, right, so-called black capitalists, which evolved out of the Nixon era, right? The Nixon would come the word black capitalism. You see what I'm saying? He's the one who put that together, right? And, and, and trying to, to hold down what was a resistance movement going across this country, right? Rioties and, and, and insurrections going across this country. He said, well, we got to throw some money at these people, right? And, and in, uh, in order to create a division amongst them, right? And so that's what the, the black capitalism came about, to create divisions great class struggle, class divisions amongst us. And so it, it, one of the things that you recognize that in, that in terms of the strategy of the system is what? Divide and conquer. Mm. Right? Old age tactics. And they use it everywhere they can. Right? And so that's what it's all about. Right? To ensure that we are divided so that we can continue to be conquered. Mm. Gotcha. All right. I want to dive back into um, your experience in prison. How were you treated by the prison staff administration? And then how were you treated by um, the inmates, your peers, and the folks around you? I was a political person. Right. The administration knew that my being in prison was based upon my politics. Right. They understood that I was not a quote unquote a common criminal. Right. Mm. They knew that I was not an illegitimate capitalist. Right. Trying to become a capitalist by illegitimate means. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They knew that. And so they treated me like that, right? Because I stood up in the prison system like that, right? I am a political prisoner, and you're not going to treat me like me, these common criminals, okay? Uh, like a common criminal, okay? Because I'm not. Right? And so, therefore, I got my respect from time to time, right? There's times where I have from, from white racist Nazi Aaron Brotherhood uh, guards, you know what I'm saying? They didn't care uh, how I stood up or how I maintained my own dignity, right? They wanted, they wanted to uh, 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 degrade me, dehumanize me, demean me, devalue me, right, as they do most of people inside these institutions. Keep, it, keep this in mind, right? Guys going inside the penitentiary, they don't know the law. They don't mm-hmm. know the law. But those who run the system, they know the law, right? And so therefore, they know that the people they got in their charge, according to the law, are slaves. That's what mm-hmm. the law says. The law says the prisoners are slaves of the state. That's not what I say. That's what the law says, black and white, right? Ruffin versus Commonwealth and the Jones versus North Carolina Prisoners Union. The court stated when they're trying to organize themselves, you cannot organize yourself. You cannot become a, a, a union, right? You cannot become a, a free person in your in your organizing for your labor, right? right. Why? Because the law says, the amendment says, you are a slave of the state, right? My knowing that, refuting that, was why I organized. Well, I, I was in prison for 49 years, right? Mm-hmm. That's why I went to the pro board 14 times before they granted me release. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so that's what that's all about, bro. Yeah, I maintain my dignity and every, every place I could, I could, I tried to teach and, and, and try to uh, learn learn and teach. I was able to get a, a uh, degree in drafting while I was inside, right? I got a, a certificate for office management while I was inside. I got a bachelor's degree in psychology, I'm assuming a bachelor's degree in sociology and a bachelor of science degree in psychology, right? I wanted to get a master's degree, but they wouldn't let me go to the institution where they have a master's degree. They told, told my lawyer, he got too much education as it is. He got enough education. You don't need no more education. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said he's too smart as it is. Interesting. They told my lawyer that, black and white, yeah. So at the same time, um, you are speaking and educating um, gangster disciples, members of Crips, Bloods, um, and a lot of young people that was involved in some, uh, you know, violence and things like that. Um, what was your experience like with them? 
Uh, why were some of the prisons against you teaching them? Oh, I don't know about any prison, the prisons, the yeah. prisoners. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course they didn't want me to teach them uh, how to become liberators. They didn't want me to teach them to become abolitionists. They didn't want me to teach them to become emancipators, right? They want them to have the criminal mentality, to maintain the criminal mentality. Why? Because when they get out, they're going to come right back. You see, there, there's no corporation, there's no corporation except for the prison system, right? That does not care about the end product. They get raw material coming in, right? And they got raw material going out, right? They don't care about what goes on inside. If, if the people on the inside don't care about how they can improve their own condition and their understanding of who they are, right? Mm -hmm. And because our people have been colonized, colonizing their mentality, right? Then they don't, don't have, they don't even have an a, 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 a inkling about what it means to, to fight for your freedom or move towards your freedom. And so for those of us, that's the reason why uh, during the, the, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, when a lot of political prisoners were ushered into the prison system, right? They created what they called uh, FBI and, and the government created what they called PRISAC, P R I S A C T, right? PRISAC. What was PRISAC? To investigate what revolutionaries are doing inside prison and suppression, mm -hmm. right? Because these because these prisons began to become universities of revolutionary education. You see, uh, that's what happened in Attica, 1971, right? When the the, the, the comrades inside there, which was a slave insurrection. Slave insurrection, they said they weren't going to be herded like beasts anymore. L.B. Barkley said, We will not be herded like beasts anymore. We are men. And what did they do? They slaughtered them. Mm. The state slaughtered them in the prison yard, killed them. 39 people, 41, including some of their own. That's how vicious and barbaric these assholes, these people are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They will murder you. You see what I'm saying? Only yes, to maintain sir. a system of white supremacy. Mm. So, so uh, what were the, were the uh, the young young kids that you were teaching in the prison system were they re receptive to the information yeah, you were giving? Were. I got guys, I got guys, uh, I got guys out here in the streets now who, who have been paroled and out in the streets, and they see me and say, "Yo, Jaleel, man, it wasn't for you. I don't know where I'd be right now, right? It wasn't for uh, your comrade Noah, Sheikh Noah. One for your comrade Herman Bell. One for your comrade Jah Heath. One for your comrade Seth, uh, Robert Seth Hayes." One for your comrade of Balagoon, Wacy Balagoon. It went for your many, many other comrades who came into prison, right? And began teaching, right? Setting up classes, whether in the yard or in the classroom, right? And began to raise people's consciousness, right? These people would still be doing the same stuff they're doing, because that's the only thing they know, mm -hmm. right? And so they all the time want to suppress the political prisoner, right? Put them in isolation, right? Divorce them from the rest of the population. Try to create conditions where he can be murdered or killed. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, that's what's going on at that time. But yeah, yeah. there are there are I got some mentees, mentees who are mentees out here in the streets now, and some of them are organizing in the streets today. Right. You can't say, yo, what I learned from you in the side, man, I'm bringing this stuff back out to the community. Yeah. Powerful, powerful. Um, so you you uh you 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 approach parole, um, and you apply ten times, you get denied. Um, what were the what, I was released on the 14th, on the 14th. 14 times, excuse me, excuse me, 14 times, and you were denied. Um, under what reason were you denied, and then what did it take to eventually gain your freedom? Good question. And, and it's, let me put it this way yeah, I was denied 14 times for the nature of the crime, something that would never change, right? No matter how brilliant I became, no matter how uh, uh -huh. Non confrontational, I was right until I was provoked. Right, uh, uh, they maintained that I had not changed. Right, even though I'm an elder, a senior, right, mm -hmm. I'm still that 19 year old. That's what they saw on paper that 19 year old. Okay, and so it wasn't until I got COVID. Now, let me tell you the story, right? Very brief story. Uh, during the course of the epidemic, uh, the pandemic, right. Uh, COVID started rapping into into uh, uh, the uh, prison system, right? And so I decided because they weren't providing us the necessary protection to prevent us from getting COVID, I decided to have my attorneys file a habeas corpus to to the court, stating that these people are not providing me the necessary uh, safeguards against COVID. Therefore, I should be released temporarily. Until they find out how they're going to establish this, because I didn't have a death penalty, right? 
uh, uh, before they established how they're going to do the protocol for COVID. You know what? The court granted it. Hmm. Temporary release. Whoa! We weren't expecting it. The court granted it, right? And you know what they did? Letitia James, the Black Attorney General of New York State, appealed it. Hmm. Appealed that decision. And in the course of fighting that appeal, I got COVID. Wow. I got COVID. Got it bad. I had to go to the had to go to the hospital. I was on oxygen for five days, right? As a result of that, right? So then, when the appeal went up to the uh, to the appellate court, the appellate court said this question is moot, right? Because it was released was to prevent him from getting COVID. He already got it. Death sentence. They tried to give me a death sentence, okay? Even though the court granted me a release. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So those are the conditions that I had to had to deal with in, in, in terms of uh, the medical health situation that goes on inside these prison systems. That's the reason, one of the reasons why I'm fighting so hard to end mass incarceration by way of ending penal slavery across the country. Mm-hmm. And the people, wherever you are in this country, let me make this point to your audience, wherever you are in this country, organize a campaign to end penal slavery, to end compulsory labor inside these institutions. All right? Whatever seven states have so far have removed the language of penal slavery. Relations of compulsory labor from out of the Constitution. We're working on New York right now to end, to end penal slavery in New York State. Right? And if you do so, what happens? You change the whole dynamics of the prison system. Right? What? Because they can't exploit your labor anymore. They can't reap really exorbitant profit from this pennies on a dollar labor. Right? And so they take the incentive away from mass incarceration. You see what I'm saying? They make no money. They can't make the money. Right off our labor, all right, and so that is a fight against mass incarceration. And every, everywhere we go across this country, we should be talking about that ending penal slavery. Right, right. So, um, what exactly was it that you know led led to you being able to to walk out of prison? Okay, well, after they recognized, right, because it became a hoopla, right. Of course, right. That I was granted release. And they wouldn't release me. Then I got COVID and, and had to go to the hospital for five days. When I got back to the pro board, they said, yo, man, you've been to enough. Who are going to let you go? Basically, right? That's the only mm-hmm. reason. So the court had already granted me release. So they turned around and said, this time, we're going to let you go for real. Mm-hmm. So walk walk us through that that experience, leaving the prison after 49 years. And, and also, too, man, like 19 years old, your thinking changes a lot. Um, from you know, forty nine years ago, do you look back and think about like, dang, I really wish I would have made different decisions, or do you just accept um everything that you know you you did at that point in time to lead to where you were at? My only regret, my only regret was not being there for my daughter and being mm-hmm. for for my family, for my mom. Right, that's my only regret. That's the other regret. Gotcha. Right. So walk us through that day, man, of you leaving the prison. Um, I know, you know, you were you were reading a lot about what was happening on the outside and you were um, in talks with a lot of people on the outside. But it's different. I know when you experience being on the outside yourself. So 49 years is a long time for the world to go by without you, man. So what was your experience when you got out of there? And um, how, how, did, how what was your viewpoint, man? Like, did a lot of things change or did they remain the same? Uh, for the most part, for me, other than the technology, other than technology, majority of the situation would remain the same. Right. Keep this in mind that although they kept my body in prison, my mind and the spirit has always been on the streets. Mm-hmm. I'm always trying to figure out some kind of way I can uh, contribute to the overall struggle all the years that I was inside prison. So by me being attached to the movements in the streets, allowed me to understand what was going on out there in the streets. So then when I got out, right, on uh, October 6th, uh, 2020, right, they took me right from the prison to my parole officer. They escorted me to my parole officer. They didn't let me out. They just didn't let me out of, uh, out, of, out of institution. They came and got me. Took me to my parole officer, gave me my, my papers that I need to have, put an ankle bracelet on me. Ankle bracelet, a monitoring ankle bracelet on me. I had to wear an ankle bracelet for six months. Right? For six months, I wore an ankle bracelet. So I'm still under supervision. I'm under parole right now. I'm still under supervision. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so for me, it was a question of to what degree I can do the work Right and not violate parole. Okay, so uh, the major problem that I had getting out of penitentiary was the iPhone. <laughs> Took me a long time, long time to learn how to use the doggone iPhone. You know, <laughs> you, stay work for me. you know what I mean? I was computer literate, 
But this iPhone had me. Had for a minute, you know. <laughs> I got it now, though. I got this sucker now. I'm not working this bad boy. You know what I mean? I, I don't leave home without it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's funny. Uh, speaking of that, what are some things you appreciate? Like, I guess being a free man now that you didn't have the luxury being while doing while you were locked up. Everything. Mm. Let's not leave out anything. Everything, from family to friends, right? Uh, to walking into a store and knowing that I don't have to wait for a CEO to tell me, "All right, get what you got and get out of here." You know what I mean? Browsing around, doing that kind, of, driving my car. Mm. Right. Yeah, you know, I always loved to drive when he was a kid, right? Uh, driving my car, just going up and go, go to the beach. Uh, um, I had opportunities to to to, uh, to leave the country for the first time, right? Uh, twice, I went to Greece. I went to uh, the international symposium, international symposium for political prisoners, right, in Greece, in Athens, Greece. I went there and made a presentation, right? Uh, me and my 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 fiance, uh, we took a, a carnival cruise. Went to Mexico and Brazil, uh, 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 not Brazil, uh, Belize, Mexico, Belize, right? Uh, uh, Costa Mel, right? Beautiful, beautiful trip, you know. Uh, uh, spending time with my daughter, my my grandchildren, and my great grandchildren, okay? Uh, beautiful thing. And having that year, having that year with my mom, right? Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate that, man. Um... Uh, appreciate you sharing all that with us too, man. Um, so you've, you've shared a lot, um, you know, in prison, out of prison, and you've been doing so much, um, for those that are younger of the younger generation and want to create change, they don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. Um, what advice would you have for them? Oh, several. One, go to nationaljericomovement.com. Learn about the political prison. Join the nationaljericomovement.com. Go to spiritofmandela.org slash people senate, right? Learn about the spiritofmandela.org people senate. Join that. Uh, um, <clears throat> get into an organization that's about building in our community, right? Organize decolonization programs, right? Self-help programs for our community, right? If you want to improve yourself, improve your community, right? That's how you prove yourself. Really, right? How do you contribute to the well-being of your community? But by doing so, you contribute to the well-being and satisfaction of yourself, right? One thing I thought I may mention about uh, capitalism is based on two principles: individualism and cooperation. Individualism and competition. What is the opposite of that? Unity and cooperation, right? Let's build unity amongst our people and let's be cooperative amongst ourselves, right? Let's build cooperations, cooperatives, and build unity amongst ourselves. That's the opposite of capitalist imperialism, okay? That's the way that we build towards a, a nationhood, right? I actually, again, I may mention, I did it for myself as a new African, mm -hmm. right? By 1968, 500 uh, revolutionary nationalists uh, organized themselves in Detroit, and they established the foundation for the provisional government of the new, the provisional government of New Africa, right? PGRNA, right? And they're still operating today, right? To free the land. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So be about liberation. And there's three things. Become an emancipator, become an abolitionist, become a liberator. One of those three. If you're not one of those three, then you're a problem, right? If you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem, okay? And for us, we need to build these decolonization programs to free ourselves, right? Another, if you read my book, you will read the part where it talks about the national strategy of Froling Land, Front for Liberation of the New African Nation, right? That's the book. That's the book, right? Front for Liberation of the New African Nation. And in that book, it describes in detail, right, how to build a decolonization program and why to build it, right? And then what we're going to do is build a way this decolonization program into a national network called Front for Liberation of the New African Nation. Okay, so we're moving forward and building our, our, our struggle for complete dissolution to dissolve this relationship that we have with white supremacy. Mm. Got you. So on the other end of the spectrum, um, you have, I, I don't know how you did it, man, 49 years. Uh, and at some points in time, you were in isolation. 
um, by yourself, uh, punished for for teaching, um, and just the difficulty of that time frame and keeping your mind intact. Um, so, what advice do you have for prisoners that are going through that right now and struggling with their mental health, and the political prisoners are the ones facing life and things like that um, to to maintain um, their sense of sanity in themselves? Well, there's there's no uh, panacea uh, to that. Right, there's no clear cut, just one cut, cookie cutter, you know, way of doing things. Every person has to go deep inside themselves to find their own strength, to find out who they really are as a person. There was one time where I was in isolation for two years. Wow. No sunshine, no windows, no fresh air, right? Locked in a cell 23 hours a day for two years, right? Almost lost it. Almost lost it. I, 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 I admit this. Right? I was in bad shape for a period until I was able to really ground myself, ground myself and say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to come out better. Right? You have to have the will to survive. You have to have the determination. You have to have some arrogance and tell his wife, was, no, you ain't going to break me. Mm. Period. I'll not be broken. Period. Right? And then you know yourself. You really get to know yourself, your strength and your weaknesses, right? You build on your strength, right, to challenge your weaknesses. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And in doing so, in knowing yourself, you know your enemy. Well, uh, 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 Sun Tzu, right, uh, the art of war. Say, know yourself, know your enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories, right? Mm-hmm. If you know who you're up against, you know the dynamics who you're up against, and you know what you're capable of handling, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. Right? Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, before we close out, you recently did a talk. Thing. Let me say yes, one sir. more thing about that, too. Right? I'm also a Muslim. Right? And the result of that, I believe in the higher being. I believe in the divine. Right? And then, therefore, I attach myself to something greater than myself. Okay? And that's where I get my real source of energy, my real source of understanding of who I am as a person. Right? By recognizing that this world that we live in is transitory, right? I knew people die coming out the womb. There are people dying 10 years after they uh, uh, come out the womb, right? You mm-hmm. never know when you're going to leave this planet. So for me, and what we are taught as Muslims, always be prepared, right? Always have your soul, your spiritual self in the position that when you go, you're ready, all right? Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, you recently did a talk at SUNY Brockport um, that was very controversial. So you were, it was going to be in person and then, you know, and what police got involved and the community got involved and they were like, we don't want this guy here and da da da. He's a murderer. He's a cop killer. Um, and it became virtual. Um, so can you, can you talk about that event? And then, um, absolutely, absolutely. if you felt yeah. like it was a success and then also too, I read, uh, uh, um, uh, there was a student that was a part of the event and she stated that, well, it was good. He did a good job, but I felt like he should have apologized or, um, you know, come to grips with um, his crime and what he did. And I don't think she really followed your story, but um, <laughs> she would say you should have been a little more apologetic. So what, what what are your thoughts on that? Well, I have no thoughts about ignorance. Mm-hmm. Right? People got to learn, you know, so people are going to say things that they don't understand or don't know. Right, based upon their own emotional state of being. I understand that. But this is what happened. Uh, a professor uh, by the name of uh, Raphael Allen, right, a professor at Brockport, he invited me over to make a presentation right, to a class of students. When word got out that I was coming, uh, uh, some of the uh, right-wing teachers, professors at the Brockport felt out of place that I would be coming there to school. And so they made a noise about it and brought it to the attention of um, uh, the police department and certain certain uh, politicians, right? Community politicians. But the students, the black students, were rallying for me to be there. Okay, so that's a big rally. It was it was the students on one side and these right wingers and white folks on the other side, right? Saying they didn't want me there. So at, at some point in time, we decided that uh, for the safety of all, that I would not go to Brockport, and I had some other students who was going to Rochester University. They set it up so I can go to Rochester and make my presentation at Rochester University. So now, take this in mind. If they had kept their mouth shut and let me go there, 
there was probably been no more than 50 kids in the students, 50 students in the, in the classroom. But by raising the big hoopla, right? Mm -hmm. we, were on, we went online at 500 people online plus 50 people in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This wow. how you, this how you make this how you make lemonade out of broken lemon. Okay, that's what we did, and we just sat we just sat there and talked and sipped on that lemonade, and it was mm. sweet. Yeah. Yes, sir. And it was a very good uh, presentation and talk, by the way. I enjoyed listening to that. Um, so, just uh, I just want to paint uh, a picture here real quick. Um, so let's imagine a world right where Black Panther still exists. Huey P. Newton is not murdered. Bobby Hutton is not murdered. George Jackson is not murdered. Fred Hampton is not murdered. Um, there's no such thing as a political prison. They don't exist. All right, Jalil never went to prison. All right, a lot of these people never went to prison. Um, what do you think that world, what does that world look like? Freedom. What was the word you used? Freedom. Mm. And what is that? What is that? Mm -hmm. People are capable of determining their own destiny by not being interfered by others with other agendas. Mm. Got you. That's definitely something to think about. I want to ask you one more thing real quick for, before we wrap it up. Um, UEP Newton talked about like some of the mistakes made within the Black Panther Party. Um, and he said that he kind of wanted to stop the arms, whole, the whole thing with arms and guns, because he felt like that was the main focus of the, the party and other things were not focused. And um, when when they went away with making it illegal to open carry it became a whole a whole big thing. So what are your thoughts on that? And um, if, if you can go back and fix some of the issues within the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army, what would they be? Okay, good question. Excellent, excellent, excellent question, right? Because it goes back into the, the called mens rea, the mentality and the thinking of the people at the time, right? Neither Elgin Clinger or Hugh P. Newton understood to what extent they were being manipulated by COINTELPRO. Right, and that's what created the split in the party. Right, um, when Huey was in, inside, Eldridge was basically running the party. Right, mm -hmm. and Eldridge was taking the party in its natural projection towards a more militant, more radical stance. Okay, when Huey got out, he didn't recognize the transitioning from what was before he went in to what it was after he came out. That we were more militant and more prepared to engage in straight up revolutionary struggle, right? Yeah. And so what he decided to do was what we call at that time uh, revision, right? We, can, we, we say he was revisionist, but in hindsight, we can think more critically about what he wanted to do. He wanted to bring the party back into a community organizing, uh, 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 mass-based organizing uh, organization, okay? Mass-based organizing organization and, and, and party, a political party, which was not a bad thing. But what Hugh didn't understand is to what extent the people was prepared to engage in struggle at that time, right, across the country. Mm. And so what's what he should have done, hindsight, right? He should have took the whole Black Panther Party and said, y'all, go underground, go underground, go to work. And what I'll do, build up a new mass organization, right, to support the underground movement. You see? And if that had happened, whoo, man. Yeah, this struggle be over with by now. Done. We'd be good. We'd be good right now. All right? Because we had had the infrastructure and the organizational, uh, the organizational wherewithal to build a revolution, right, and sustain a revolution, right, by virtue of the organizing uh, uh, for that movement. All right? You got to have three parts for, for that. You got to have a above ground, you got to have an infrastructure, and you got to have an underground. Right? And if Huey had told the Black Panther Party what is chapters across country, all y'all go underground, right? Or y'all want to go underground, go underground. And those who want to be with me and build a new above ground organization, come with me build a new organization. That means the Black Panther, the Black Liberation Army would have been isolated, right? And through attrition, destroyed. Because it had the infrastructure to maintain the supply, the supply line of different materials, TE, and cetera, that they needed. We had the personnel, the people willing to continue to work and build themselves and go under underground and continue the movement. Mm. Right? What do you mean by underground, by the way? Right, exactly what I said. Um, clandestine operations around, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's no worries about that. Right? Like, our struggle. 
That's what I'm talking about. Continue the armed struggle, right? And then we'd have above ground organizations to continue to organize, educate, and build the institutions on the above ground that would maintain the struggle on that level, educating people and preparing them for those who are prepared and willing to, to go into the underground. Mm. Got you. you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Continuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to get into a quick activity here before we close out. Cole, what's your favorite? Identifying a few of your favorite things. Um, so I know that um the great John Carlos was one of your one of He's your mentor. uh, one of mentors. mentors. Yes, he, yes. Yeah, he was my math, he was my math mentor when I was in high school. Yes, sir. So what what was your favorite lesson learned from the great John Carlos? Oh, uh, well, naturally, with math, right? Because uh, that's who used my math tutor at the time. But but also the the, the idea that uh, sometimes you have to sacrifice all to win all, right? Mm. And for him, he sacrificed his career as a runner, but he won his legacy as a as as a revolutionary, right? Or as 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 one who uh, advocated for for the, for the best benefit of black people. When he and Tommy Smith threw their fists up and their black fists up in the air, that was just, that was all around the world, all around the world. Black people are resisting, right? And he contributed to that resistance. And that's the reason why that photo is iconic today. Mm -hmm. right? It has that kind of self-sacrificing meaning to it. Gotcha. Uh, your favorite memory as a Panther? <laughs> there, there are no favorites. I love the every bit of it. Yeah. Um, favorite books? That you've read? Also, I have my own. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> that's too many to call. Uh, top top three. Top three: Wretched of the Earth, um, Malcolm X, uh, Autobiography of Malcolm X, and Speeches of Malcolm X, uh, and uh, Martin Luther Garvey. Gotcha. Uh, the philosophy of Mose the philosophy of uh, uh, Martin Luther Garvey. All right. Uh, favorite revolutionaries outside of members of the party? Jacob Guerra. Hands down. And any particular reason? Huh? Any, what's yeah. your reason? Yeah. yeah. Um, he was an internationalist, right? He believed, one thing he said, he said, listen, revolutionary, he said, this may sound silly, I'm paraphrasing, this may sound silly, but revolutionaries are motivated by a strong sense of love. He yeah. understood it. He knew. Right? There's a love for ourselves, a love for our people, that allow people to sacrifice their lives. He understood that. Mm. All right. Love is the greatest force that we have on this planet. All right. Although we are ruled by hate. Mm. Well said. Um, favorite life gem that anybody has given you? My daughter. Got you. All right. Uh, favorite person you'd like to sit down and have a conversation with that or alive? Al Hazmanik Shabbat. Mm. Marcus Garvey. I want to debate him. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I can also say, I can also say Prophet Muhammad. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. As we wrap up, um, I know right now the work that you're doing is based on, um, you know, political prisoners, and um, you talked a lot about that today. Um. You got people still locked up, like uh, Mumi Abu Jamal, um, the uh, Move organization. People that were a part of the Move organization, um, they're still locked in prison after all this time. Um, so no, 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 they're not. All of them are out. All of them are out. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah. that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, so, we have we have we have brothers like we have brothers like uh, Iman Jamil Alamein, who they know is innocent, that's in prison. We have brothers like uh, of Ronzo Barrow, right, who is on his way out the front door. He had been granted parole. And Anthony Gonzalez, was attorney general at the time, called the prison and said, don't release him. Wow. Right. Out the door. He was being escorted by the superintendent out the front door. Right? He mm -hmm. got a call from the attorney general told him, don't release him. Yeah, he went all of his stuff. Right? He's still in prison today. Wow. Because he's a political prisoner. Rochelle McGee. Rochelle McGee was found not guilty of killing the judge. Not guilty. The court withheld that verdict from the jurors. Right? He's still in prison today. Oh, 58 years in prison. Mm. Okay? So we have a host of comrades. We have uh, uh, Kwame Shakur. Right? 
an, an organizer in, in Indiana prison, right? He came into the prison system as a JD, a gangster disciple. Now he's a leading uh, leading uh, political activist inside the prison system for uh, prison lives prison lives matter, by right? movement that he's organizing, right? Mm -hmm. In support of Florida, the Front for the Liberation of the African Nation, right? And the work that uh, we're doing collectively, right? We have comrades all across this country who should be out of prison, that Jericho is fighting for, that the Northeast a Political Prisoner Coalition is fighting for, that the spirit of Mandela and the People's Senate will be fighting for to be released from prison. Mm -hmm. Okay, So uh, our struggle continues. Yes, sir. Now, what more can people do? Because I feel like somebody like Mumbi Abu-Jamal, he's had the support. He's had global support. He's had people protesting. He's had people writing, people doing everything. And yet he's still locked up. So what more can people do um, to help some of these political prisoners? That's a good question. He has to continue to support uh, Mumia, to continue to support our political prisoners in every way, in, in, in capacity that, that they can, or willing to sacrifice in doing so. Uh, I, I do I definitely believe, you know, Mumia just lost his appeal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from a quote unquote assimilationist uh, black judge. Right, who, who, whose affiliation, uh, whose association, whose assimilation to the system is greater than a love for black people, particularly uh, for Mumia Abdul Jamal. And so, for us, uh, like I told you about Letitia James, who uh, would not be released, black woman, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who's assimilated into the system for her own ambition, right? She wants to be governor, I guess. I don't know what she wants to be. But in either case, uh, she only had me dying in prison. All right, so we have these individuals, right, who are assimilations. They got to be charged. They have to be charged, right? That's usually why we have to have class struggle in, a, in, our, in our national liberation movement, right? So we have to charge those who are assimilations. We have to charge the national, the black national black bourgeoisie, right, the petty bourgeoisie, those individuals who find themselves in cahoots with our enemies, right? The so-called Uncle Toms and Aunt Janies and whatever you want to call them, right? Those individuals have to be challenged because they are a detriment to our freedom, right? And so that's part of the efforts that needs to be done. We have to engage in class struggle. Class struggle, as I write in my book, Three-Phase Theory for National Liberation, first phase, class struggle for national unity, right? We have to engage in class struggle to build as much national unity as we possibly can. Second phase, national unity for self-government. As we build, as we build national unity, we start building the infrastructures, the decolonization programs across the country, and start linking them together to govern ourselves. And once we have established those governing forces, right, the governing institutions, by us, right, our next phase would be self-government for national independence. Right. Gotcha. One, two, three, boom. Got you. Um, so you know, we've talked a, a great deal about a lot of the work that you've done before prison, in prison, out of prison now. Um, when it's all said and done, man, what is the legacy that you want to create for yourself? And what, what do you want people to remember about the work that you did? I know you don't want them watching um, movies like a uh, black exploitation movie that came out about the party. Um, trying to remember the name of it. <laughs> um, but actually, I won't even, I won't even say the name of it, but it was a, a movie that identified your case and, um, also, uh, things that occurred within the party. So, um, you know, people might remember those things, but what do you want them to remember about, you know, the real Black Panthers and the work that you've done in your legacy? Well, I don't want to remember me. I want to remember the work. I'm not important. It's the work that's important. Right? They can forget about Jalil Luther King, right? But remember the work, right? Carry on the work. Right. I tell young people today, say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm 71 years old, right? I, I ain't got much more further to go in this incarnation, okay? I'll be moving on to the next incarnation, whatever that may be, all right? But when I do so, I want to have somebody behind me to take the baton. Mm. Right? I tell people, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon from generation to generation. That's how we get to where we are today, from generation to generation. And so for me, it's important that we know that there are a generation prepared to pick up the baton, pick up the baton, and carry on the struggle in this marathon for liberation and independence. It ain't about me, bro. Right? And so that's not that's you know, for me, I'm I'm when the time comes, I'm gonna be a bag of dust, right? In the dirt. Okay, done. And so if there's any legacy for me, 
it'll be the book that I wrote, or the books that I wrote, right? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, people take the book and, re- and ride with that book, right? If they want to remember me, ride that book out, right? Until the pages turn frail, turn brown, okay? Yeah, yeah do that. Yes, sir. Appreciate that, man. Um, and um, I definitely will remember uh, people that fight, man, because a lot of a lot of um, people now are refuse to fight and think it's futile. And they give you know examples of look what happened to the Black Panthers, like as a as an example as well. Um, so you know, I appreciate the work that um, your generation has done. You know, for my generation and the generations to follow, um, and laying out. Uh, an example of resistance and um, not just accepting things that can't be accepted. So I appreciate that, man, and the work that you've done. And um, I definitely think we'll be having more conversations as time flows. Um, but before we leave out, man, can you leave us with your favorite quote and what it means to you? Yeah, I write it on the board. Right. Frederick Douglass, power receives nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance is prevails and where any one class is made to feel that society is organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither person nor property will be safe. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, listeners, this is a moment in Black history. Um, Jalil is definitely walking Black history. Um, and I think everybody should know who he is if they don't already know. So please share the program. Let people know about the work that's been done here. With Jalil, um, the Jericho movement, um, the spirit, being, spirit of Mandela, spirit of Mandela, yes, sir. The people sent it, yes, sir. Being um, veteran, veteran member of the Black Panther and Black Liberation Army. All right, uh, let me say, let me get a selfish plug, right? Yes, sir. If you want the book, go to blackdragonmme.com. That's blackdragonmme.com, right? And you can get the book. I was just about to ask that. Also, too, for people that uh, want to know how to get in contact with you, how to reach you, uh, maybe for an event or anything else, how would they find you? They can go to jalil.mutakinggmail.com. Jalil.mutakinggmail.com. All right. There it is. Uh, Jalil, it's a pleasure having you on the program, man. And again, Thank appreciate you. the work. I appreciate that... you, man. Likewise, likewise. Uh, listeners, please support the work. Um, get the book, get your copy, go through it. Um, and he has more work out as well. And then um, also, you know, for events, reach out. I don't think, you know, we should be doing Black history or move uh, things and things like that without reaching out to some people that um, are walking Black history. So definitely reach out to Jalil um, and support what he is doing. And of course, remember, your mind is the most powerful tool in the universe. Therefore, if you can think it, you can do it. If you believe in it, you can be it. And if you fight for it, you can have it. The world is yours. This has been your host, Mr. G, and I will see you next time on Mastermind. Uh, so every day I'm going hard. I'm talking business, bank accounts, and credit cards. And somehow we defeat the odds and making sure that no one starves illegal or you had it.